episode 189 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll learn about the seven most impactful changes that transformed my tennis game. Hey everybody, this is Mirabon and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. And today, as I mentioned in the intro, I just want to talk to you about the seven most impactful changes that really made a big difference in my tennis game over the many years. And as with many of you, you know, I've gone through a whole host of struggles in tennis. It's definitely not an easy game, as easy as the pros make it seem to be. Uh, a lot of us uh, come back from the doldrums time and time again, and uh, that's kind of the beauty of tennis and life is to undergo obstacles and then figure out ways to get over the hump. Sometimes it takes a few days to figure it out. Sometimes it takes many years. And for me, it's usually been the latter. But let's just jump right into these seven changes that I've made, these big changes that have helped me. And the first change is thinking more deeply about strategy and tactics. So my level of thinking about actual strategy was very minimal for many, many years. I mean, I would say it was on the low end until I started the podcast around 2016. And growing up as a junior, my whole game was all about just getting more balls back than my opponent. Uh, fortunately, I was fast and fairly fit, and I could track down a lot of balls and hit heavy spin. Uh, on occasion, I might whack a few forehands, but that was really the extent of my quote unquote strategy. And uh, I was purely a reactive player. And then once I got to college, my coaches started teaching me some strategy, but I still felt lost at times in understanding how to construct points properly and how to dissect my game. Uh, and I remember just hearing my coaches talk about a particular point that they had watched and we had all watched. And I just kind of sat there thinking, you know, how I didn't really understand what was going on. Yeah, the struggle was real for sure. And it really wasn't until I started interviewing, learning, uh, and implementing the, the strategies and tactics that I learned from all the amazing coaches that I interviewed on the podcast and on my online summits that I started to really broaden my understanding of winning strategies and tactics. So just the process, the repetitive process of learning about these strategies and tactics and then implementing them over and over is really what got me to be able to think more deeply about strategy. Uh, and, you know, I've talked to people like Craig O'Shaughnessy and Paul Anacone and Peter Freeman and all these great coaches and, you know, and in, in, in watching them just, you know, draw these diagrams and dissect points from great players as well as amateurs. That's how I've been able to uh, just implement better strategies and tactics. So uh, now before matches, I always come up with at least one overall strategy, usually a couple, that I want to implement before my matches begin. So something very simple like, let's say, attacking the weakness, attacking the backhand, or maybe playing the ball deep and down the middle. And then I think about the tactics. So strategy and tactics are a bit different. You know, strategy is just a broader uh, way you're going to approach something. And then the tactics are things like the point patterns that you're going to use and how you can set up the points so that you can implement the strategy that is going to win you the match. So uh, it's just been definitely a journey from not being very confident at all in how to uh, think about points and break them down and, and select strategies to now having a lot of, uh, of knowledge and background from, from learning from the best. So it's been really a privilege to, to talk to all the coaches, and I definitely want to thank them for coming on. And it really is true that tennis is just like a game of chess, and the key to winning is thinking of and executing the right strategies and tactics. So that is my first big, most impactful change out of the seven, is thinking more deeply about strategy and tactics. All right. Number two is practicing with a purpose. And believe me, I have a tendency towards being lazy, whether it's playing tennis or doing anything else. Uh, it's, it's just there. It's, it's human nature. You know, the body 
and the mind want us to be safe and to do the easiest things, but uh, it's it's not going to help you. So I used to not have any sort of practice plan at all, and I would just go out there with my practice partner or group of players and just just play, just hit the ball, not really have any purpose, and I think I wasted a lot of valuable time when I did that. And I also used to be way too relaxed and joking around during practices. And this for sure hurt me in my matches. You know, one of the top questions that I get from players is why do they end up playing well in practices, but then when it comes to match time, they're unable to replicate that play in matches. So this type of lax intensity in practices is one of the main reasons for that disparity. And I've asked many other coaches about it, including Jorge Capistani, I believe he's an elite master professional. And the solution is to add more accountability and intensity to your practices. So accountability is especially one that I didn't really think about as much. But as I mentioned, you know, coaches like Jorge told me how effective this can be. So you can do something very easily, such as uh, you play points uh, up to 10, up to 12, whatever, or a set, but then whoever loses has to do 30 push-ups or whatever you want to choose. And when you do this, then all of a sudden there's something on the line to play for, and then you're mimicking to a larger extent the environment that you are going to have when you play a match, which obviously there's something on the line and then the intensity is attached to that as a result. So practicing in a serious environment is critical to helping you play better in your matches. So that's why it's just so important to really have intensity and purpose when you're practicing. Uh, it's, it's, It's kind of like the difference between explaining a concept or an idea to a colleague versus presenting in front of a room of people. If you don't seriously practice your presentation, then when it's game time, then it's probably not going to be a very easy time for you when you are presenting in front of a room full of people. So hopefully that uh, comparison uh, made some sense for you all. But yeah, just practicing uh, intensely, having accountability, and also the purpose of you know creating a practice plan based on what you need to work on uh, in your game. Uh, that's really going to help you. Your it's going to naturally help your intensity when you have a plan. When you when you're out there and just you know hitting the balls like I used to do, then naturally your intensity is going to be lower. That is the second big change that I made: practicing with a purpose. Number three is understanding my own game and. Self-assessment, as with most things, is usually the first step that you've got to take if you want to start on the road to progress and improvement. So you want to understand your strengths, you want to understand your weaknesses, and then you want to let this guide what you need to do uh, in terms of what you need to work on in practice. Uh, You also want to let uh, the understanding of your own game guide how you construct points. Um, For example, if your main advantage over your competition is your fitness, then you probably would want to extend the points rather than uh, just going for huge shots, you know, every second or third ball, let's say. And if your strength is, let's say, your forehand, then you want to set up the points to enable you to hit as many forehands as possible. Maybe that's going to the backhand right away. Maybe that's pulling the opponent farther and farther off the court on the forehand wing and then going to the backhand and then you're going to get your forehand um, set up like that. Um, But yeah, you've got to figure out uh, that tactic to to, uh, mesh with the strength in your game or strengths, hopefully strengths with an S. So, you know, one key to better understand your game is to have a coach Uh, to watch what you're doing, or at the very least to record and analyze your play with your phone or camera and a tripod. So best case is both the coach and recording your play, but 
if you are un- are unable to have a coach or you know there's days where you don't have a coach with you as you know most of the days we won't have a coach with us then you do want to record your play uh, as often as you can so that you can watch and analyze what is going on to better understand your own game i mean i've done this to great effect i've discovered uh, a hitch in my serve swing. Uh, I've I've discovered sub suboptimal shot selections and inefficient footwork technique that I never would have found out if I didn't watch myself on video or have a coach pointed out. So, uh, number three is understanding your own game, very crucial. So do a uh, perform a self assessment of what's going on. Like I said, your strengths, your weaknesses, uh, that's going to go a long way in determining how you train and how you play your matches and set up the points. So number four is using aggressive plays. And like I mentioned in the first change, I was just mainly a reactive player for many years, just getting the ball back, just grinding all day. And you know, I wasn't a very aggressive player. And so then I used to let the opponent take control of the point. And the result of that, it was was pretty negative overall. I would be very exhausted after matches. And I, I often felt like the matches that I won were in some sense given to me rather than me taking them, uh, if that makes sense, you know, rather than stepping up to the plate and, and you know, hitting the right shot, I would uh, oftentimes, just get the ball back uh, and and let the opponent miss. But then I gradually realized that there were more efficient and effective ways of winning matches. You know, some simple examples are taking advantage of short balls when they come to you and following them to the net when appropriate to put pressure on your opponent. Uh, I also utilize more serve plus forehand plays, again, going back to thinking more deeply about strategy and tactics, uh, throwing in serve and volleying, in doubles, it's a lot more of poaching, uh, a lot more I formation and Aussie formation. Uh, I had uh, my friend Ian Westerman from Essential Tennis uh, present on disruption and chaos in doubles, I think a couple years back on the Tennis Summit. Uh, which is coming up this April, uh, mid-April, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, and this was a huge thing, you know, when you when you use more of these plays and you're more active at net, then you're gonna really make your opponents unsure of what you're gonna be doing, where you're gonna be going, and that's so key in producing errors and also giving yourself easy putaways at the net. I mean, one story that I've mentioned maybe a couple of times before was a USCA league uh, match. <laughs> one of the last ones before uh, we had to, you know, stay inside for a long time due to the pandemic, but it was, uh, we, we were in this super tiebreaker at eight, seven serving. Uh, my partner was serving and then You know, I I decided to just go aggressive because I figured that my opponents were most likely to use the the safer serve return and and that they were most likely going to return cross court. So then called uh, a poach on the my partner's serve to the deuce side and I picked off uh, that return with a volley into the open court and then uh, on the next on the nine seven point uh, to clinch it. Uh, I either did an eye formation uh, and called left or I poached. It was one of those. And again, I picked off the return. And if that was uh, a few years ago, I would have just stayed in the normal uh, standard place uh, for the volleyer uh, when the server is, uh, when that volleyer's partner is serving. And I would not have moved. Uh, I didn't really poach much before. So. Uh, this was definitely a change that ended up winning me the match. You know, think about if I had not called that play and had not been aggressive, you know, who knows what would have happened. Maybe we would have lost one or both points and lost the match. So uh, using aggressive plays can really be a huge boon to your success. And I highly encourage you to th- to figure out how you can introduce aggression. And also in talking to Emilio Sanchez, He mentioned, uh, and we kind of went into like how the footwork kind of feeds into this a bit uh, with the open stances kind of being overused, but 
Emilio said that a lot of players they just kind of hang around at the baseline with an open stance instead of moving forward towards the ball, and you know that's something that you have to kind of take note of. And I, I did a a strategy video on YouTube a couple months back where I took a look at、uh, Tennis Troll,、uh, one of his matches, and I noticed that both he and his opponent. They had several opportunities where, if they were more aggressive with their footwork, they could and should have hit an approach shot and followed it up to the net. But instead, they waited for the ball, and this lack of aggression definitely cost them a lot of points. So again, using aggressive plays can be a big help to your success rate. Number five of the most impactful changes that transformed my tennis game. Was continuing,、uh, or rather, pursuing continual improvement instead of wins. So again, going back to the past for a bit, I used to always be concerned with winning and what my ranking was, and I was so concerned with these things that it ended up, <laughs> ironically, negatively impacting both my winning and my ranking,、um, just because of you know. Overthinking about the the results, you know, instead of focusing on the process.、Uh, but most importantly, this type of、uh, thinking stunted my long term development for my game. You know, that there, there would be other players who were developing big serves, big shots, serve and volley games, while I was only focused on trying to win the match at all costs. So it was unfortunate when I got to the 18s.、Uh, the 16s was、uh, one of my best、uh, ranking years, where I think I was ranked number seven in the Mid Atlantic and number three in Maryland and、uh, top 200 in the country, which was awesome. But then in the 18s,、uh, some of these players that were、uh, a few ranking、uh, spots below me. They all of a sudden, with their bigger games, they they turned around and beat me, which is、uh, painful for sure,、uh, because they had focused on the long term development while I was just focused on winning, and and so I didn't concentrate on developing a bigger serve or a bigger、uh, forehand or you know fixing a technical flaw in my backhand.、It、was just all about getting those balls back and making my opponents make mistakes. So. It's really critical to to figure out what level you want to get to, and then approach everything with that goal in mind. And with that, you want to just pursue that continual improvement with the goal of getting to that level that you want to get to. So, if this means sacrificing your number of wins and your ranking temporarily, then that's better. Than not reaching your potential in the end by stunting your growth by thinking so much about winning. So definitely pursue continual improvement instead of winning, and you'll win more. <laughs> All right. So number six of the seven most impactful changes that transform my game is a consistent stretching and mobility routine. This unfortunately is really ignored too much. And it was ignored by me too much. I used to ignore stretching and mobility exercises. I I wouldn't stretch after my matches. You know, I would just feel like oh, everyone else is walking off the court. Like I'll just walk off the court with them and chat, and then I'll just go home and relax. But I gradually noticed, especially when I got into my late twenties, early thirties, that that my mobility was. A lot more restricted, and it was、uh, it was painful. I I wasn't able to rotate my body quite as far.、Uh, I felt quite a bit of hip pain、uh, after matches would be particularly terrible. I I remember I used to walk home from the car in massive pain and was limping from the car to the apartment elevator, and、uh, it wasn't after I. Realize both from the pain and also from speaking with you know top fitness experts like Dr. Mark Kovacs and Mike Boyle, Dean Hollingworth, and and so forth,、uh, just how critical it is that you have a proper stretching routine and that you foam roll and and you know perform other uh, mobility uh, exercises. 
and techniques. And uh, one rule that really uh, stuck out to me was when I interviewed Mike Boyle, and I'll put that uh, podcast episode in the show notes page, but he has this 1% rule where for whatever age you are, that's the percentage that you should focus on your mobility. And so to put it, you know, very simply, if you're 35 years old, I wonder who's 35, maybe me. Um, yes. But uh, if I am 35, then that means that 35% of my training should be focused on mobility. And that makes a lot of sense because as you get older, uh, your mobility tends to decrease. And so that's why you want to focus even more uh, of your time as you get older on that. I, I distinctly remember making a joke to Mike and I said, what the hell should I do when I'm 105? Uh, knock on wood. Um, but I don't think he got that joke. <laughs> you know, 105%, that, that's impossible. Anyway, uh, let's let's go get back on track here. But, um, you know, you, you don't necessarily... I mean, I would stick with this 1% rule. It doesn't mean that that's like the the percentage to follow. Um, but it's a good one. And so now I always stretch after playing and after working out, or I would say, you know, 90% of the time I still could be better with that, but, uh, you know, always after I play for sure. Uh, and I also, uh, integrate foam rolling and using my Theragun into my routine. We'll leave a link to Theragun in there as well, uh, which is an affiliate link, but you know, even a simple four to five exercise stretching routine is going to make a huge difference depending on which exercises you choose to do or which stretching exercises. And I put a video on YouTube, uh, which, which was all about a simple stretch routine for tennis players. And so I will also link to that. seems like I have a lot of uh, things to link to here. But definitely check that out if you want to just get a simple stretch routine handed to you. And there's also a free download of the routine. So you can just download it and have it as a spreadsheet. I think it's a Google spreadsheet, which is uh, particularly handy dandy, uh, in my opinion. So that is number six, a consistent stretching and mobility routine. Massive difference in not only your your tennis game, but just your overall health and how good you feel versus um, complete trash when you <laughs> can't move at all because you didn't stretch and um, work on your mobility. All right, so number seven of seven here is a very important one on the mental side, and it is not basing my self worth on whether I won or lost a tennis match. Beforehand, if I lost, then I used to feel like I was less of a person somehow. Um, but I gradually realized that tennis is just one part of life. You know, you hear Rafa and Roger and Novak say the same thing that there is a lot more to life than just tennis. And I was talking with a mental game expert, I think it might have been Joey Johnson, and he said that this is the big problem for players and why. They uh, have such a tough time and can't break through because they have this terrible cycle of attaching their self-worth to tennis, and then they end up feeling much worse about themselves overall as a person when they lose matches, and then so it just causes this downward spiral for both their tennis uh, success and their life. So that's, that's definitely no good. So if tennis is giving you a hard time, you're having some tough results, you know, just refresh, maybe play a different uh, sport or game for a little while, uh, not too long, but you know, well, however time you need or however much time, uh, refresh, recharge, and then come back at it with the goal of long-term improvement, and then you'll be back on track. So again, just when you lose a match or you don't play well, just realize that there's a lot more to look forward to. Uh, and that tennis is not everything, and that will counterintuitively uh, help when you're not just focused on tennis uh, 100% of the time. So those are my seven most impactful changes that transform my tennis game, and I'll go through the list once more right now. Number one is thinking more deeply about strategy and tactics. Number two is practicing with a purpose. Number three is understanding my own game. Number four, using aggressive plays. And number five is pursuing continual improvement instead of wins. 
Number six is a consistent stretching and mobility routine. And number seven is not basing my self-worth on whether I won or lost a tennis match. All right, I hope you really enjoyed this list. And uh, let me know what your number one, uh, most favorite one out of all those is. Uh, Maybe there's one or two or more that you're struggling with here or that you haven't implemented yet. So just pick one. Uh, first and and implement that and see how it goes for you and let me know. I also just want to let you know about Tennis Summit 2021. Amazing that it's going to be the fifth year of the summit. We had almost 14,000 people, about uh, 13,800 people attend last year. And we've got an amazing lineup. Uh, we're over a month away, but we we have already close to 40 coaches which is just awesome. Uh, people like Dr. Mark Kovacs, Rick Macy, Paul Anacone, Jeff Salzenstein, Peter Freeman, Gigi Fernandez, Jorge Capistani. Uh, these coaches are amazing. They've coached or won <laughs> Grand Slams, and uh, it's really exciting stuff. So I've just been really, really busy and hard at work arranging all these coaches to participate on the summit and the logistics and you know, all that stuff. So it's really fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and it just, uh, if you want to stay in the loop about the summit, then join my newsletter, uh, at tennisfiles.com to get updates about the summit. And when registration opens for that, uh, which is free by the way. <laughs> so it's going to be going to be fantastic. And it's online of course. So I look forward to seeing you there. And if you enjoy this podcast, uh, then I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review for it. And you can do that at tennisfiles.com slash Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app that you use to listen to the show. Uh, Just let me know uh, what you think about the show and what's working and what isn't working for you. And I'd be happy to do my best to to make it even better. Uh, But I really do appreciate all the emails. Uh, I, I just sent out an email to to you all, uh, whoever signed up uh, this morning, and I got some really nice emails about the podcast. So thank you so much for that support. It definitely keeps me going. Uh, and I would just like to leave you with a quote of the day, as I often like to do at the end of the show. And this one is by Nelson Mandela. I think we've had a few quotes from uh, from Nelson Mandela, and this one is: "It always seems impossible until it's done," and that is very true. I mean, the hardest part of Accomplishing anything great or anything at all is starting. Uh, so before you start, it it might seem like an impossible task, but you know if you work at it a little each day or however frequency uh, that you think is proper, but uh, you it's important that it's consistent. Then all of a sudden it's done. So just keep at it, keep working, keep showing up, keep doing the work, and you will get to where you want to be. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I'm looking forward to more fantastic episodes with you as well as Tennis Summit 2020. Definitely go to tennisfiles.com for now to sign up to my newsletter to get those updates and uh, when, on when you can register as well. So with that, thanks so much for tuning in. This is Maribon Aranchad, and I'll see you on the next episode of the Tennis files podcast. Take care, everyone.